in recent weeks, there's been controversy over the lack of a national Pokedex in this fall's Pokemon Sword and Shield games. While this is a heartbreaking development for many fans, myself included, looking at the Pokemon main series formula and the way the Pokemon trading card game is handled, it seems like this was inevitable. So what can we learn from this event about sustainable game design? Let's talk about it today on Draw 5 Move 5. Hey everyone, and welcome to the table. My name is Gabe, and this is Draw 5 Move 5, a show where we draw connections between the mechanics behind our favorite games. On June 11th, during a Nintendo Treehouse Live at this year's E3 video game conference, Junichi Masuda, the producer of Pokemon Sword and Shield, revealed to fans that Pokemon Home, the utility that would transfer Pokemon from older games to Sword and Shield, would only transfer Pokemon that were native to the new installment. Over the coming days, Masuda would clarify the details and reasoning behind this decision, but it did a little to quell the rage of many fans over the realization that the first main series Pokemon games to ever grace a home console wouldn't allow them to bring forward their favorite Pokemon. In an unprecedented move, Masuda even acknowledged fans' concerns via a tweet and an announcement on the official Pokemon site, but its meaning left fans even more upset. We hear you, but the decision is final. Pokemon Sword and Shield, and what they mean for the future of main series Pokemon games, serve as a lesson in sustainable game design. Masuda stated in an interview with US Gamer on June 12th that we knew at some point we weren't going to be able to indefinitely keep supporting all of the Pokemon, citing the sheer number required with higher quality animations and models and the desire to balance the battle system as key factors for a decision that he says was very difficult to make. In other words, Masuda doesn't believe that the Pokemon formula of becoming the champion and catching them all is viable anymore. We've never heard this lack of faith from Masuda or anyone else in Game Freak until now. My opinion is that in the beginning, they, like the rest of us fans, truly believe this formula would be sustainable. Perhaps they didn't expect the major success the series had. If we look at the timeline over the last 20 years, however, we can see the point where Masuda and the team at Game Freak realized that indefinitely creating Pokemon and supporting all of them in all future games wouldn't work. And from Masuda's reasoning and the steps they're currently taking, we can learn what the future may hold for not only Pokemon, but for other games that use this evergreen formula of indefinite backwards compatibility. The first instance visible to fans that Game Freak was losing faith in their formula was in Pokemon Sun and Moon, released in 2016. In every Pokemon game up until that point, the player would fight their way through 8 gyms in order to then face the Pokemon League, where a win would declare them the Pokemon Champion. Sun and Moon shook this formula up by doing away with the gyms, replacing them with Island Trials and Grand Trials. The player, instead of fighting a gym leader, would face a powerful wild Pokemon and a few of its allies. They would do so on each island until they had defeated all of that island's trials, at which point they faced a Grand Trial, which was much more similar to a fight with a gym leader. While all the same in function, the number of gyms was altered from 8 to 11, and the feel of the experience was significantly different. We were exploring wild areas and enjoying these interactions with different Pokemon, something that you didn't get doing puzzles in gyms. Reception of this change was positive, and I think that was a key factor in finalizing the compatibility decision for Sword and Shield. Fans liked it when Game Freak tried new things with the Pokemon games, including not only this shakeup of the gym formula, but the introduction of Mega Evolutions in X and Y, which breathed new life into many old fan favorite Pokemon. So perhaps their brewing decision to cut many of the Pokemon wouldn't go over as poorly as they first thought. And I say brewing because as much as I hope Game Freak is still willing to patch in all the old Pokemon we've come to know and love, I think this decision has been set in stone for years. Not only since the positive reception of Sun and Moon, but from the moment Masuda and company realized they couldn't indefinitely keep supporting all the Pokemon as they worked on Pokemon X and Y. Looking at the rate we've received new Pokemon in all 7 previous generations, there's a notable dip around X and Y in Generation 6 that continued at an unprecedented level in Generation 7. On average, a generation either has close to as many or more than Generation 1's initial count of 151 new Pokemon, or has about two-thirds as many new Pokemon as Generation 1. This usually happens in an odd-even system, where in the odd generations there are more Pokemon, and the even ones have less. At X and Y's release, however, we only had half as many new Pokemon as Gen 1. Sun and Moon, an odd generation, only had 88 new Pokemon in total, 
107 if you include the Alolan forms, special regional versions of older Pokémon with new attributes. This is still smaller than the expected amount for an odd generation, and in fact is even smaller than most of the even gens, bar only X and Y in Generation 6. This is where we start to see a trend, because X and Y were the first games in main series history to use 3D graphics. After release, the team had modeled a total of 721 different Pokémon, not including models for different forms and Mega Evolutions. In addition, every model had separate animations in battle for idle movement, physical attacks, special attacks, and status attacks, plus all of the animations for other features of the game, such as the Pokédex and Pokémon Ami, where trainers can pet, groom, and feed their Pokémon. If we estimate conservatively, that's about 10 different animations for each Pokémon. That's over 7,000 animations. In addition, we have to keep in mind Game Freak needed help from Creatures Inc. in the modeling process to make this tremendous undertaking possible. This was a long, hard process for Game Freak, and I think this is when they had their realization. In every generation that's gone by, the sprites of each Pokémon have been redone and reanimated. These sprites even change from game to game in the same generation. This is because with each subsequent generation, Game Freak has better hardware at its disposal, and has figured out how to optimize their hardware better throughout each generation. Keeping this in mind for Sword and Shield, and knowing the importance Game Freak puts on all of their Pokémon looking and acting accurately, we come to the same conclusion that Masuda and the team did during the creation of X and Y. Assets couldn't be reused during a hardware jump. They would have to remodel every Pokémon, every time there was a new and stronger hardware available. And while it's true that Sun and Moon and Pokémon Go reused the X and Y models, they were only able to do this because the hardware didn't change. In addition, the new Dynamax mechanic in Sword and Shield means that every Pokémon now needs a second model. The models can't be upscaled because it would reveal the imperfections and lower polygon count that we can't see when the models are small. Larger models require more polygons, which not only takes more time to create, but more hardware strain to render in real time. That leaves not so much space for holding all 1,000-ish Pokémon we're expecting to see. The new generation's graphic capabilities on the Switch would demand that new 3D models be made for what will be over 1,000 different Pokémon and forms by the time Sword and Shield is released, and over 2,000 if we include the additional Dynamax models for every one. Masuda and Game Freak realized this during the creation of X and Y. They realized that indefinite backwards compatibility would be impossible. They couldn't do this every generation, or every other, not with the time between releases and the quality the company and fans would expect from them. They realized in this moment that for the fate of the franchise they were going into damage control mode. They started creating less new Pokémon to not only avoid having as many to model, but to avoid creating as many new fan favorites, so that when the news broke that full compatibility wouldn't be supported, there would be fewer Pokémon to disappoint their fans with an inability to use. Even with the limited Pokédex, we can still expect to see well over 600 Pokémon models and over 6,000 new Pokémon animations in Sword and Shield. It's still a massive undertaking. Masuda also mentioned that part of the decision to gate what Pokémon could enter Sword and Shield was to maintain balance in the battle system. In order to understand this part of Masuda's reasoning, we need to first talk about Power Creep. As games evolve over time, older strategies need to be replaced if the company that runs them wants to make money. As such, they introduce new strategies that are slightly better than the old ones to encourage people to drop the old product and buy the new one. Over time, this leads to a slow but steady rise in the power ceiling of the game, called Power Creep. In Pokémon's case, every generation will always have some good and some bad new Pokémon, but the good ones will always have to be a little better than the old ones if we're going to use them. Every generation of competitive play in Pokémon, there are always some Pokémon from the new generation and Pokémon that, while older, have received some kind of update like a Mega Evolution, a new move, type, or ability that makes them competitively viable in the current gen. Many of the competitive teams that see success are similar. The newest and best on offer become what people in the competitive circuit play the most. However, after 20 years of this process, Game Freak has reached a point where the power creep is closing off their design space. They've painted themselves into a corner. They can't keep designing successful new Pokémon that feel worth catching and training if all of the old Pokémon outshine them, so they have to be ridiculously powerful. Continuing that trend would result in an exponential increase in the series' power ceiling, completely cutting off any Pokémon that aren't overpowered from being usable not only in competitive, but even in the main story mode. 
The decision to limit the Pokémon coming into Sword and Shield pushes the bar back down, reducing the power creep significantly and freeing up design space for new and interesting Pokémon that are strong, but not overpowered, to shine. This is an idea borrowed from the Pokémon trading card game as well as many other TCG like Magic the Gathering and Hearthstone. Rotation Whenever the competitive season in Pokemon TCG rolls over to the next tournament year, most of the old booster sets and the cards in them are no longer playable. A new pool of cards to choose from is created, forcibly changing the format and encouraging player creativity to craft new decks centered around new cards. At the same time, the designers can better balance these cards, knowing that they only have a year's worth of material to plan interactions around. In Masuda's response to fan outrage, he mentioned that just because our favorite Pokémon aren't in Sword and Shield doesn't mean they won't be in future titles. This means that every generational rollover can be its own rotation, where the designers know what Pokémon will be available and can design new ones accordingly without having to break the game to encourage players to use them. They make their own little mini formats in each game and each generation. Looking at how other games function, and seeing this process the Pokémon series has gone through, it's not surprising the formula failed. Microsoft doesn't keep supporting Windows XP and Vista in 2019. They encourage the use of new operating systems like Windows 8 and 10, because they can't keep creating new ones while indefinitely supporting the old ones. The same is true of Dungeons & Dragons. Every new edition of the game sees support for the previous one die off. The amount of resources that Wizards of the Coast would have to allocate to not only produce 5th edition, but to continue creating new content for and supporting 4th edition, 3rd edition, 2nd edition, even 1st from TSR for example, would be far more than they could expect to make the money back on to support. Pokemon is a series that tried to be evergreen, always supporting and updating its older designs while introducing new ones. But for the manpower it takes, combined with the quality expected and the deadlines for producing new games, Game Freak couldn't keep up with this approach forever. Yu-Gi-Oh! is another of these evergreens, using no rotation and consistently introducing legacy support for older decks. Every card in the roster doesn't need to be reprinted year in and year out, but after what happened to Pokemon, I'm uncertain the game can last this way. Only time will tell if the Pokemon formula's failure is a mark of doom for the evergreen genre, or just an isolated case of poor planning. Thank you so much for watching. You have my humble and eternal gratitude. What did you think of the conversation? How do you feel about the National Dex issue? Have I explained well why the decision was made? And are there any other games you can think of that use this same evergreen formula but are still succeeding with no end in sight? I'd love to hear your thoughts, so let's keep this discussion rolling down in the comments. If you enjoyed the conversation and you want to hear more from me, hit the like button. I'm putting out new videos every week on games and gaming mechanics, so subscribe and dingling that notification bell so you never miss an update. My name is Gabe, this is Draw5Move5, and until next week, go have a good game.